Hello, everybody, uh, both people here in the audience and also people who are going to be watching this streaming later. Uh, I'm going to just cut to the chase because we have about 45 minutes. This is our panel on data and accessibility. Uh, we have Joe Devon as the moderator, accompanied by Jenison Asuncion, Stephen Erbrick, hope I didn't mutilate that, and uh, Joe Sweet, um, where's it, John Sweet? John, it's that second one. John, we, I'm yeah. sorry. So I'm going to let them take it away. They'll take your questions if you're here in the audience during the panel, and uh, we'll end in 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Joe Davin. I am uh, CEO of Diamond and also co-founder of Global Accessibility Awareness Day and chair of the GAD Foundation. And I'm telling you all of that as a lead-in to Jenison, who I will ask to introduce himself and you'll see why in a moment. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Jenison Asuncion. I am co-founder alongside Joe of uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day and the GAD Foundation. And in my day job, I head up accessibility engineering evangelism at LinkedIn. Thank you, Jenison. John Sweet. Hey, I'm John Sweet. I uh, currently am the Senior Director of Accessibility Compliance at Pluto TV, which is a free ad-supported streaming company. And uh, there I lead up all of the accessibility and data compliance efforts. Thank you, and now Stefan. Yeah, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan Average. I'm the Chief Data Officer at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I'm also a professor here at USC in the Keck School of Medicine in the Department of Radiology. Um, so I'm uh, joining the panel to talk a little bit about healthcare and specifically how it affects accessibility uh, in the nexus of uh, data and data science. Thank you, Stefan. All right, so we have had some conversation amongst ourselves that really flowed nicely, and I would like to make this conversation, although I'll lead with questions, but if you feel like you're enjoying the conversation, please go ahead, and if anyone has questions, just raise your hand and we'll take questions as we go along. So why don't we kick off with a question that I think anybody that comes to a panel like this would want to know. Is there bias in data science when it comes to people with disabilities? And in what form does that take? And since we do have Stefan from the healthcare side of the equation, if you can have a healthcare angle to it, or if you, know, if you want to comment from a healthcare perspective, please do so as well. So why don't we start with you, Jenison, and then go across. So like any marginalized uh, group or minority, uh, I, would, I would say yes, there, there is some level of bias. And part of, part of that is because a lot of folks in data science, similar to a lot of engineers and designers, don't interact on a day-to-day -day basis with people with a variety of different disabilities or impairments. Or they think that uh, people with disabilities or impairments are just like folks who are wheelchair users or folks who are blind. Uh, they don't necessarily know that 70% of people with disabilities have disabilities or impairments that you cannot see with the eye. So just in, 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 in that level of misunderstanding or not knowing who might have a disability or what it defines a disability, I think that that absolutely plays into a level of bias uh, on the part of some um, data scientists. Thanks, Jenison. And John, feel free to comment. If anybody doesn't have an answer for a particular question, that's no problem either, but um, please okay. go ahead. <laughs> I, mean, I just want to disagree with Jenison, just to be contrarian, <laughs> but I, I really can't yet, because there, there is bias inherently. Jenison kind of touched on the way we collect data, the way that we look at the people from whom we are collecting data, but there's also a, this data divide in AI and the way it uses data in order to learn in machine learning systems. Uh, for instance, if we look at um, uh, graphical image recognition, the, the, uh, the way that uh, computers learn how to recognize images can differ if there is a photo taken by a person who is blind or in uh, transcription services, there are accents that originate from disability that can be difficult for transcription services to interpret. Um, but in actually most recently and maybe the most impactful is uh, self-driving cars have pedestrian recognition systems probably called something else and they've been shown to have a really hard time with people 
in wheelchairs or children who are smaller, just recognizing that there is something there. Uh, so there is a bias in data, the way it's collected, the way AI uses it, and it can put people at risk or leave them behind, and it continues, yeah. Yeah, so I think that the, if you look at healthcare, I think there's two categories here. One is a patient care side, and then one is the medical research side. Um, I think that the bias on the on the care side is probably very settled, and um, it's probably uh, more worth to talk a little bit about the research side, which is uh, really um, important when you, as an investigator, make selections of patient cohorts that you want to investigate, that you have an in inclusion criteria uh, for um, you know people with disabilities. Uh, this is very important because otherwise you kind of uh, go into one of the bias areas, which we know from, from data, this would be a selection bias um, in, in your cohort population, which you study um, not representing the, um, the, the cohort of the people with disabilities. So this falls at the end of the day to the individual investigators. There are protected categories um, under HHS guidance, um, but on, when, when it comes to disability, it's really a, a selection um, from the individual investigator which has to take care of making sure that there's a broad inclusion um, when uh, a research um, on human subjects has been considered. That stipulates, obviously, um, for any investigation that the, um, the, the, uh, the consent process for the, uh, the research is appropriate, um, you know, for people with disability uh, with in, in mind. So this falls then back to the ethics committee, uh, which is commonly called the Institutional Review Board, or IRB, at the individual um, investigative side. Let's say Children's Hospital here at uh, Los Angeles has their own IRB. USC has their own IRB. Um, and these folks on the IRB, they will actually review these um, study protocols, um, you know, under the specific guidelines of what is a patient cohort, including then um, the, the folks which have, uh, you know, disabilities. And so setting the guidelines from the IRB as well as um, being proactive as an investigator will help to avoid a bias. Because uh, if you look at the population, uh, the population has a, a, a markup of uh, all kinds of individuals, and we need to represent this. This is very important. Because once you collect the data, um, it's done, right? So every conclusion you draw later on from the data um, becomes then based on that, um, on that data set which you collected. And if that's biased, then obviously you get a biased outcome. Um, I want to add some additional component here, um, specifically uh, to pediatrics, to the children's side of healthcare. Um, many times, um, research is actually becoming um, the, the kind of a last resort of, of treatment. Um, and so, saying that about bias and selection of patients who can enroll in clinical trials or uh, medical studies, um, it becomes very amplified um, as a disadvantage for people with disability, or can be. Um, here, the uh, enrollment is really based on, um, you know, a last resort treatment option, and so it falls specifically into the, uh, into the uh, responsibility of an investigator to making sure that there's no bias in selecting candidates for, um, for a study entry. Sorry, if, if I could just to kind of hop, um, uh, on, on what Stefan is saying and, and stretch to a different industry, which is around recruitment, uh, because a lot of AI is now being used in recruitment processes. And the conversation within the disability community is around, uh, you know, the bias that could be there. And that this is all about making sure people can be hired to, so they can be productive members of society. But if we have uh, AI systems that, for example, are judging people at interviews, um, I would probably fail uh, or, or be flagged in an interview because I can't make eye contact. And if, if the system doesn't know that I'm blind, uh, that would be an issue. Um, it's also come up uh, with uh, other folks with other disabilities, neurodivergent folks, and just people with disabilities in general, if they have a speech language uh, issue uh, in talking uh, and those kinds of things where their mannerisms, the way they speak, the body language, uh, eye contact, all of those things might be flagged by an AI process that has only been used to screen the quote-unquote 
folks without disabilities. Um, so that's just another area of, uh, hopefully at this point, it's an opportunity to put a cautionary tale out there for folks here in the audience and online to really think about that if they're involved in AI uh, for hiring uh, purposes. Thanks. So I'm going to ask a follow up uh, because I think what really speaks to people the most is real concrete examples. And until you have that concrete example, it's a little bit hard to really visualize what we're saying and to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So just a couple of examples that I've seen uh, is uh, there was the, a, a story with the IRS where they knew that uh, there was someone who was uh, blind and was a braille reader and they sent uh, a regular letter that was not in braille stating, oh, you owe this extra amount of money to the IRS. And then this person couldn't read it. And then they kept sending, they kept adding fines, adding fines, adding fines, not knowing that they should have sent it or knowing that they should have sent it in braille, but they didn't, right? And uh, in the end, it, it was a total, you know, breaking of civil rights, right? So there's, there's so many examples of this nature. Uh, here's another one. A friend of mine really worked hard on creating uh, uh, American Sign Language and captions, particularly in emergency services. And I just thought, wow, this really hit me hard. Like, wow, we, we didn't really spend too much time thinking about it, but you really need to do it. And then all of a sudden, COVID happened, and you're seeing that uh, you, you, you know, they really had to make a push for the ASL and it affected the entire community. If you're deaf and you're unable to get the guidance, you might break that guidance. And it's so important both for their lives and it can be for others. So do you have many other examples you, you might think of? And this is for anyone uh, where may, may, whether it's COVID or testing or some, some medical issues on a more personal like note, how, it can, how, how you can be missing it uh, when it comes to accessibility. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll just think of easy. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like going for, for, uh, for something here, but um, nobody wants to answer it, so I'll go on to the next one. Uh, what are some considerations when creating personas for people with disabilities? Uh, yeah, so personas can be really useful in trying to understand a segment or a type of person in your in your marketable audience or in your research base. Um, but in accessibility, so often there is an attempt to aggregate around a type of disability. But just as with so many other segments of society, there's a ton of variation within these segments. Not all disabilities are the same. Uh, there is inherent variation within them. Uh, and trying to focus on this medical model of disability when, you are tr when you're building personas can be um, really unhelpful and regressive and unproductive. So I think the best, the most effective examples of research personas I've seen involving disability focused more on a social model of disability um, where you look at the challenges or the mismatch in between an individual and their environment, or where you focus on functional limitations or on assistive technology being used. Um, you're going to learn a lot more about your research base or your market base if you're trying to understand the ways in which people are trying to connect with your service or they're trying to connect with some aspect of their environment uh, and are facing limitations. Uh, and focusing on that gap is going to be a lot more effective than focusing on what is going on with an individual and how can I typify this individual into, you know, one very limited group set. Uh, so yeah, I think in personas focusing on this mismatch and focusing on challenges in access uh, is, is the way to go where I've seen the most success. Any, anyone else have thoughts? I think you, I think you encapsulated that really, um, really well. So I, I have nothing except to maybe say, uh, if you use your favorite search engine and type in uh, user personas of people with disabilities, there's some excellent work that's already been done, uh, rather than going ahead and, and reinventing the wheel in terms of some nice personas to use when you're uh, when you're engaging that. Nancy.
like a person prototype because it wasn't a, a term I was familiar with. Because that, it wasn't what? It's not a, a, a term I was familiar with, so I wanted to okay. make sure I was following you. It's yes, a when prototype. You're, okay. Yes, when you're when you're developing digital products, you create or really any product. Uh, there's a term called personas and you create a persona around what is a typical user and there's different user types for, for everything, right? Uh, so you want to get your main user types and your, your personas, uh, but very often people with disabilities are not covered in the user personas. So I was asking if there are any particular considerations and I'll do part two of that. And that was a great answer, John. Um, but let's take the part two of that was, okay, here we have the personas. Uh, we're doing all this work and now we're reporting out uh, something. What about data visualizations or reporting? How does that, um, how does that side of things, uh, how do you make that accessible? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, take, I'll take the first crack at that. Um, when you're looking at data visualization accessibility, there's probably a few buckets that you want to consider. First and foremost, making sure particularly with interactive charts, that all of those are not um, interactions that are completely mouse driven uh, because there's a, a, a bunch of folks with a variety of different disabilities or impairments who for whatever reason either can only use the keyboard alone or use voice recognition software or other software that emulates a keyboard. Uh, so whether it's uh, you know sorting functionality to Zoom, uh, Functionality that might only reveal data when you hover over it with a mouse. Uh, think about, well, what about people who can't use a mouse? How would they interact with it? So that's one bucket, uh, so keyboard uh, interaction. The other one is uh, related, uh, or, or two next ones are related, having to do with contrast. Uh, so making sure your labels and all of those things are have a good contrast uh, for people with uh, visual impairments, but also for people with certain uh, print-based learning disabilities. Uh, but, and then also kind of related is making sure you're not using color alone to denote meaning in a chart or any type of data visualization um, is also uh, critical. Uh, providing uh, a summary of what's in the chart is also very useful for people with a variety of visible and non-visible disabilities who just might find the chart either just overwhelming or distracting, so pointing out what the highlights are. Um, two more things I'll mention. Some charts, uh, some data viz take advantage of uh, uh, motion. Uh, so that's to kind of get some people's attention, but it also acts as a distractor for some people. So having the ability to turn off uh, any, anything that's in motion or animated, uh, animated information so that people aren't distracted by it. Um, the other thing I'll mention is one of, the, one of the areas that's often cited to make a data visualization accessible is, well, provide a table version for, for people who are blind so that they can use it, read it in a data table format. That's fine if all the chart is doing is presenting the data as, as that, but as soon as you start having the ability to manipulate the data, providing that data table is not going to be sufficient to make that accessible to folks, for example, like myself. Uh, because sure, I can see the, the static data, but I have no ability to sort or do any, any interactions with that data. Um, so one of the things you can do, as an example, is make it uh, dot, uh, exportable as a .csv so you could pull it up in, for example, something like Excel. And again, if, if you're providing ability to sort or do anything like that, um, that at least is available. So it's just a matter of, of looking at your chart and, and, and understanding and making sure that there's a one-to-one -one on par experience when it comes to not only viewing the data, but manipulating that data set as well. I'm not sure, Joan, if you... That, that's yeah, great. Okay, yeah. When you said, I've got two more things to say, I thought there's no way that one of those is the thing I'm going to say, but it totally <laughs> was. Uh, but yeah, I, I work with engineers a lot in my field, and I myself just inherently, but also engineers, we are all lazy. We're all looking for an efficient way of doing things. And uh, inevitably, designers that I work with will come up with really cool data visualizations 
uh, new innovative ways to look at emphasis at look at data. Um, and so one of those really easy slash lazy ways is providing a CSV file, providing a downloadable a tabular format for to look at the data. But the problem that you, the thing that you lose when you just have a data set in front of you that might have dozens of rows, dozens of columns, is you lose this uh, this gestalt holistic sense of what is the trend in this data. Hmm. Somebody, uh, somebody who's cited can look at a complex chart and might be able to pick out, obviously we have our own internal biases and in how we're looking at things and we might be mis misinterpreting data, but it's a lot easier in a visual medium to pick out trends. Um, and so I think one of the big challenges in accessible data visualization is how do you communicate trends? How do you communicate overall uh, holistic is I gotta have a thesaurus in front of me so I can stop saying trends, but look at those trends uh, in a way that doesn't require this literal visualization. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, I mean, um, I, I would never suggest as well, um, you know, when we work in accessibility, we, we always think about like multiple ways of communicating information. So I wouldn't necessarily say having a download is, would be enough. Uh, to your point, uh, John, I think having even just uh, that, that, that summary that would point out what the trends are uh, alongside would also be, uh, would also definitely be useful. The tough thing is I wonder if we can get to a point where we have that summary of the trend uh, in a way that is, does not have to be human authored, that, I, yeah. that AI can look at it. And I, I, and I know that there's some interesting experimental stuff happening by using sound um for some folks uh that apparently is useful uh, to help understand how a visualization is working and trending um i think robin hood um did some work around that so if you use your favorite search engine and, and type robin hood and sound and accessibility i think they did some neat stuff around that um i had something else but i Forgotten what that is, so I'll, I'll stop there. It'll come back, and I love the answers because that's what I was kind of going at before. Or, or what I was leading to is, for example, in healthcare, when data is presented to people with disabilities, if you're a screen reader user uh, and you can't talk to that information, uh, it, it, it affects privacy and so many other other avenues. And so, thank you for both of you for kind of going there. And it, I guess that's this this relates also to healthcare. Um, before I, I uh, do that follow-up with you, Stefan, the Robinhood app, essentially it was like these charts where you have it going up and down, where maybe you'll see a stock and then the sound will go higher as, as you're going up in that chart and then lower down and it used, uses sounds in order to get there. Um, so Stefan, following up on, on this, uh, you know, how to present data, what about, uh, other, what about using AI to present data? Uh, in healthcare in particular, it feels like there's a lack of attention to the end user, uh, and particularly there's a lot of uh, people with disabilities or temporary disabilities, and the way that they receive the information, um, let's say, for example, cognitive disabilities or, or, or other kind, can AI uh, play a role in uh, in perhaps personalizing the way that data is is reported or or interacted with. Yeah, thanks. I think um, so. This is almost like an undiscovered country there, um, for for not only from from a disability perspective, but even from a normal perspective. Um, so it's really hard for uh, to kind of standardize that, or it has been not been standardized yet in kind of how do you communicate um, a diagnosis to a patient, just even a. a, a in a person without a disability um, in, a, in a role of patient. So it really comes down right now to the individual physician to be um, very craftful in how to do that and how to be cognizant about even a person with disability or without disability, how to communicate that. There's really no standards, there's no, it's just, um, you know, the individual intuition of a physician at the end of the day who's kind of, you know, driving that. Now imagine, um, specifically for the audience here, um, the data practitioners uh, in, in various capacities, um, how can you actually create an, an optimized uh, visualization and communication tool um, which can not only address, um, you know, how to present a diagnosis to a patient, um, 
you know, even without disabilities. And then with the additional challenge now um, of, a, of a, you know, people with disabilities in various forms. I think that's another, another frontier which we haven't really started yet because the, the discussion hasn't been actually very recently started how we can effectively communicate medical records to, to patients. Um, that, that hasn't really happened yet. And it's kind of um, one of the, the challenges that we see in healthcare in general is that healthcare kind of lacks um, other industries in terms of technology adoption uh, behind a couple of years. And so um, keep that in mind whenever you um, uh, go into your physician's office, to your doctor's office. and um, But think about as a state of practitioner, this is another field where you can be very active and, and becoming engaged. Um, how to present data, um, have you have that skill from maybe from um, from a technological side, maybe working in a specific field, but but healthcare is really in desperate need to kind of to have effective standardized communication tools um, to interact between doctors and physicians and uh, patients. That's a big problem, not solved yet. I have got one for John. So the web content accessibility guidelines, that's what folks in the accessibility space use to talk about, uh, about hitting compliance, right? But it's web, right? Web content and accessibility guidelines. What about things like remote controls, TVs, connected devices like the Roku, Netflix, Hulu, all that stuff? Um, what, what other considerations are there beyond the web content accessibility guidelines and how should we think about those? Yeah, it's, it's totally, it's the connected TV space, which is what I call in this domain that includes uh, Roku, over the top, Fire Stick, uh, gaming platform devices. It's a totally new frontier. Uh, even the web content accessibility guidelines or WCAG, which is like the established set of rules for accessibility, they hardly apply to native mobile iPhones, tablets, Android devices, much less these totally new connected TV devices. Um, one of the big differences is on a desktop or a web top on a browser application or in a native mobile application, you'll have basically a beginning and an end. For instance, if you're using a screen reader, you can start at the top, you can swipe until you get to the bottom, and it's a relatively linear path. And you can do that theoretically, hypothetically, if it's been developed right without missing anything. Uh, but if you were on a Roku, just as an example, uh, you, don't, you no longer have a linear path through all of the content on your screen. Uh, for instance, you let's say you're looking at a on a Roku device at the Pluto TV app. Uh, if you are, we're, we're really familiar now, I assume everyone here with uh, rows of content, for instance, on a Netflix or on a Pluto TV or on a Paramount Plus, you'll have uh, rows of categories of, you know, new releases, comedies, documentaries. If you are using a Roku device and going through those rows and you're pressing down on your remote, you're going to hit the first item in each of those rows and get all the way to the bottom. You're going to miss everything else that's in the row um, if you are not, not cited. Uh, so one of the considerations that we make is <laughs> when you're using text-to-speech or a screen reader in these devices, you have to let people know you're in a row. You can press right to see more things. Otherwise, you're going to miss so much of the interface. Uh, so that and other considerations have been uh, a new discipline, a new domain, and a new challenge to figure out lately. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, just give me one moment. Yes. Um, you just reminded me of something because uh, my girlfriend has an Apple TV and she kept telling me that the remote control it ran out of battery and she keeps trying to charge it and it never works. It's always like down to 10% or zero. And I was like, this is so bizarre. So I go in, I try, I try to look and try and recharge it. And then I'm going up and down on the rows and it says, as I'm going up and down, it's like 10, 10%, zero, 10%, 20%. 
and then I'm like, wait, 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 I got it. This is a screen reader. It's the accessibility screen reader was turned on. It was just saying the volume because in, when you're a screen reader user, you typically go really fast. And so you might slow it down if you want to show other people how a screen reader works, or you might go really fast if you're really just trying to read out the content on the screen. So it's pretty funny uh, to see that. Yeah, the fix of detective work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? that relates back to something Jenison said earlier about during the sort of talent acquisition process, not being able to do the same things that maybe somebody else would do and have it maybe marked down against you because you're not able to make eye contact or something like that. So my, my company is creating a, a platform or created a platform that we thought was, you know, trying to help um, uh, make things more inclusive in uh, performance evaluations and also talent acquisition, but we found we had to switch it from a platform to a Chrome extension. And I was wondering about your takes on Chrome extensions. People's ability to use applications and uh, interact with the system. Anybody want to take that? Well, I mean, as a general as a general comment, so long as that Chrome extension has been developed to be accessible in, in itself, then I think that if if that's the solution that's being used across the board and consistently, then I wouldn't see an issue with using it. I mean, obviously, like in the situation of talent acquisition and, and stuff, we want to make sure that that uh, extension isn't. Uh, storing data that it shouldn't be and all that kind of stuff but i but in itself based on what you, but i've what i've heard you mention um again so long as that extension meets uh applicable guidelines for accessibility then i i, I don't th see that as a, as a problem i don't know john if you have a thought on it. i do not okay <laughs> thanks for the question thank you for the question if anybody else has questions please go ahead Looks like we have one, sir. Hi, my name is Martin. Uh, finding the panel very interesting. Uh, but as I'm listening to the discussion about what do you, you know, the AI looking at how do you make charts accessible? And I'm thinking it reminds me of, you know, I'm a dinosaur, so I remember back in the old days when Tyrannosaurus Rexes were walking around and we were talking about object oriented design. The idea was that you separated out you know, algorithms from how things were represented to users. And uh, so when I'm thinking about like a medical chart, what you're looking at really most of them or many of them are not so much about patterns, but they're about putting things in context. Your result is on the, is so and so on blood pressure and the high is this and low is that. And if you're in that range, that's what it looks like. So if you're a little bit above range or below range so that you're, you're giving that kind of information. But then when you were talking about the intuitive stuff that you get from looking at a chart, you know, visually, Jenison's brain does the pattern recognition. He just doesn't use his eyes for it, right? So above and beyond what Robin Hood does with the sound to go in and out, I think given how far AI is coming with creating images and understanding and mimicking images, it's almost like you'd want something that is equivalent to charts but isn't describing a chart it's more like oh here's a bunch of data and you know someone that doesn't have sight would go okay i want to see the patterns i want to look for patterns around you know let's say if you're talking about blood type look look for disease patterns based upon you know this chat chart i'm looking at or look at other kind of patterns so i was just wondering so there's a question in here somewhere the um the question is what is it can we do about kind of really distinguishing as opposed to mimicking what um, what a visual chart does? Uh, what can we do about really thinking about what are you trying to accomplish? And is there another way to accomplish the same thing without mimicking what you do for a sighted person? Thank you. Thanks. So you mean something like an Alexa style interface where you can query the report um, in a, in a um, audible format? Any thoughts? Yeah, the kind of a follow up from my earlier comments here. So the healthcare industry has kind of slowly adopted um, web portals as kind of a communication tool for, for health records. Um, 
I'm not aware that there's a really good accessibility interface to it at all. Um, the way, as I mentioned before, um, how, how data has been, how your personal data has been, your health data has been, uh, you know, documented there is, is um, it's very technical uh, in, in nature. It's not very intuitive in my opinion. Um, so I think we still have to go some, some, some more rounds of, um, you know, creating a more accessible way, um, including obviously people with disability in mind, which, which clearly is not the case right now. Um, because it's it's kind of in a phase where I well, would say whatever phase one, phase two, whatever you want to call it, where the technical ability has to be um, given, you know, from a medical record system, which is actually very quite complex. And um, now that we're creating a lot of data in healthcare, uh, it gets more challenging uh, on a daily basis. And bringing that information in a, in a useful, reader, readable form um, for, in this case, a patient. Uh, makes it uh, it's a really a challenge. So I think once we get through these challenges uh, as an industry and uh, ha have a good interface and, and standards, right now most of these things are driven by individual companies. And if you go from one provider to another provider, you have different portal logins, and it's not a lot of customer satisfaction, let's put it this way, um, about the way these things are implemented. Um, if you want to, for instance, get a a copy of your of your imaging record as an example i mean radiology um, it's still pretty much the standard to uh, give you two options one is um, we give you a cd rom hey is somebody in the audience still know what the cd rom is question uh, or the other way is to um, give you a link which you can download um, an image set let's say you have a, a volume ctm that takes about two gigabytes of data you're downloading this on your desktop what do you do with that so it's there's there's a lot of um, disconnect to the patient and the use of the data. Even that, obviously, under federal law, every patient is entitled to a copy of a record. It's not a real good interface uh, which brings this data in a meaningful way to the patient, um, and and it's not um, a lot of incentive, to be honest, uh, from a from a commercial perspective. Um, to, to do so. So I think uh, we, we need to rely on uh, societies and organi non-profit organizations to kind of drive the bus here um, to help us with that. Because it's the care providers cannot really do that. They're, they're too much on the medical treatment and, and uh, care side. Um, and the technology folks in that, in that industry are uh, typically very large companies. So I'm looking forward for startups to really kind of pick up the slack here and Come up with innovative technologies around mobile devices um, and you know creative web, web content which can solve that problem but it's it's a major problem and i think everybody has been there everybody is a patient so i think everybody had some experience with um, somewhat how broken um, the record uh, exposure and record presentation and display and visualization is in healthcare unfortunately thank you we got five minutes left, so this is likely the last question, and it's sort of a three-part question because I want to let the audience understand it first. So the first part of it is, does anybody want to take uh, the definition of audio description? The second part, does anybody want to talk about their impression of audio description? And then the third part is, uh, uh, is AI for, uh, will AI ever get good enough to do audio description? So repeating that again, anybody want to take definition of audio description? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Uh, so audio description is an audio track usually associated with video entertainment um, that describes key visual elements in the video. Uh, so for instance, if, you have, if you're watching a movie where a group of people are talking in a room and someone enters, uh, when the dialogue pauses, you would then hear a narrator say, John Sweet walks into the room uh, with a great amount of swagger. And then the dialogue would resume. Uh, so that's, that's audio description. And you can, actually, you can find it on many major platforms. Like if you, next time you're watching Netflix or Hulu, go into the audio menu, you're going to see an option for audio description. And it's used primarily um, by people who are not sighted or who uh, lack some vision. Uh, but really, just like closed captioning can be used for, in many scenarios by people who are sighted. Um, for instance, if you're going about your, your business doing chores at your house or you're cooking and you've got a show on in the background, it can be really effective to understand what's happening 
with uh, without having to rely just on the dialogue. Thanks. Um, my contribution to this three-parter has to do with you asking, will AI get good enough to uh, help with this? I want to distinguish, and I got this, I think it was from you, John, yesterday at dinner, uh, where you, you distinguished between the actual uh, authoring of the audio description versus the, the spoken uh, aspect of it. And you, you had some good points. I'm not sure if you wanted to talk about that. It seems like you're already doing it. Oh, no, well, no, no. <laughs> like, what, what was your take on on which one it would be more effective with? I think it was the latter, right? Yes. Uh, the, well, it's a much more straightforward problem to solve in having audio description be narrated and articulated by by AI, by a non-human intelligence system. Uh, the process of authoring audio description uh, by a non-human author is, is something that is beyond my Imagination, although it's yeah. <laughs> not that far beyond, but yeah. yeah. So, so, so my perspective, and then now I'm putting my computer science hat on. Um, so we see a lot of new technologies, uh, you know, coming online, and uh, recently Google has uh, brought a text-to-image um, interface up, uh, which obviously looks a little silly in the examples. I think they had a. I remember from the article I read about it, they had a dog who was sitting kind of a sushi dog house. Uh, but that, that's not the point. The point is that we're pushing the envelope, right? And so um, when it comes to um, distilling content from images and creating a human readable form of it, which would obviously help with the disability community, um, I think we're going into a direction where this becomes possible. And I would actually invite everybody to uh, not look this, you know, right now from a from a forward-looking perspective, but but do a little time travel into the back and think, what was the capability three years ago? What were our technical capabilities five years ago? And what were our capabilities like ten years ago? And then do a recollection back to now, and understand, wow, we have a lot of capabilities already developed, right? And I think that's the forward trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, so if something's not immediately available, look at the seeds. Uh, where are these things coming from? I think this, this text to image is kind of a building block to what that's so kind of, one of these Lego blocks, which will build that, that environment going forward, from my perspective. If I could just sneak in one final thing to yes. tie everything together from your very first question, Joe, uh, the cautionary tale is around bias in the authoring piece of, um, of audio description, because, you know, Someone might describe a room or a setting in one way based on their own experience, uh, or, you know, there might be a certain way that they that they are coming up with the constructs to describe things, which come from a a quote unquote normal whatever that is, uh, as opposed to maybe a movie is trying to be provocative and different, and so the interpretation uh, of what something looks like uh, might might come through with 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 uh, bias there. That's a great point. That's a great point. And I will suggest that people uh, do try out this audio description. Uh, I've tried it out and heard good audio description that makes me feel like I don't pay attention to anything going on because it'll describe stuff and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't notice any of that. I apparently don't even follow what's going on in this movie. And then you hear really bad audio <laughs> description and you're like, eh, I could do without it, you know. Uh, but I definitely recommend it. Well, thank you all. I really enjoyed and learned a lot from all of you. So thanks. And thank you to the audience, Subash, Nancy, and DataCon LA. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.